You are as precious to me as you were to your own mother and father. I swore to them that I would protect you, and I haven't. The mayor's gonna dump him in the spring. Really? Mm-hmm. But he's a hero, a war hero. This is peacetime. You think this can last? There's a storm coming, Mr. Wayne. better batten down the hatches. Because when it hits, you're all going to wonder how you ever thought you could live so large and leave so little for the rest of us. What does that mean? Rise. everyone and welcome once again to Geek Fest France. My name is Carlos Perón and joining me today I have James here in front of me. Say hi James. Hello, hello. Today we are going to be highlighting a couple of trailers we recently watched of some of the probably biggest films coming out in 2012. Obviously there's a couple of more films coming out but the big three ones that we just examined are The Dark Knight Rises, The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, and Prometheus, the alien this is not a prequel prequel. And like I said before, we watched the trailers, and these are very important trailers because they're almost kind of like teaser trailers. They're not too little of a teaser, which sometimes they put together like just the title of the movie or some CGI graphic, and that's all they give you. That's what a teaser used to be like, a very brief, brief glimpse. What they gave us this time around are what you would consider to be trailer number one. I think that's how they do them now, is they give you trailer number one, which, you know, you get glimpses of the movie. They're not heavy, heavy CGI finished products, because as usual, these films sometimes are still being shot or they're still being in the post-production process. And most likely heavy special effects are taking place right now. Musical selections are being you know laid down to tape or digital hard drives. So let's begin with The Dark Knight Rises. Now, they've apparently put out two different things. They put out, depending on what movie or what version of the movie you go to see, and I believe it's only in IMAX theaters when you watch Mission Impossible 4, I think it is, they give you a preview of the prologue of the film, which is something they've done before. When they released The Dark Knight a couple of years ago, they did the same thing. If you went to see, I think it was I Am Legend, in IMAX, they gave you the whole prologue bank robbery scene where you meet the Joker. This time around, they've done something similar to that. That, unfortunately, has not been very easy to get. I mean, you might be able to find some bootleg here or there, but they purposely don't want that released to the public until the movie comes out. It's a way of getting you to go see some other movie that belongs to that studio. What they did put out was the first official trailer, which we both seen, and let's talk a little bit about that. This particular trailer deals with what happens after the aftermath of The Dark Knight. Is that right, James? Yeah. I think as far as we're supposed to know at this point, some time has passed. I don't really know how much time and why, because I wasn't even interested in this movie. I didn't like the second one with the Joker. Wow. I found it to be overblown, and I think it made the kind of money it made, and it had the loyalty it got, was because of the untimely death of Heath Ledger. And he did put in a spectacular performance, but I didn't think he was my cup of tea. And I think that whole scene in the middle with the two ferry boats battling each other was indicative of the way I felt about this movie. It was just long, and who cares? 
Uh, but it turns out this one, once I realized what the subject was going to be, and you know, when they talk about a new Batman character, what villains is it going to be? And it's, it seems to be always the Joker, but obviously it's not the Joker. We're done with that. And when they announced Catwoman, I'm like, here we go again. And I wasn't even that thrilled with the choice of actress they picked. Yeah, this time it's Anne Hathaway. Yep. And then they talked about, oh, maybe it's going to be the Riddler. Maybe it's going to be Robin. You know, blah, blah. The Scarecrow might come back. I heard Harvey Dent's name bandied about as if he's not supposed to already be dead. But then they mentioned Bane. And if you're a fan of Batman, Bane is one of the iconic characters because Bane basically killed Batman for a spell. Now, he didn't die, but Bane and Batman battled and Bane won, breaking Bruce Wayne's back. And he was basically out of commission for most of a year, if not more, over the various Batman titles. And that made it something different for me because they announced this could be the last Batman movie with Christian Bale and oh, yeah, Nolan. That's, that's, a, that's a comedy fact. And they could theoretically end this on a downer which would be brilliant. I don't think the studio will let them, especially based on how Superman Returns turned out. But the hope in my mind is, when I heard about this and Bane, that something different is going to happen here. Now, I can't tell, and I know they're marketing it as if something's going to happen because the posters have the cowl ripped off on the ground and they, they have various fights and stuff. But then finally, we got to see this trailer. And in the trailer, you can see Bruce Wayne is definitely walking with a cane and a hobble. And some of the dialogue between Alfred and Bruce Wayne suggests something heavy has happened or is going to happen. Now, obviously, a trailer pieces are out of order, maybe, so they're throwing us. I have a feeling they're luring us in and throwing us off the trail at the same time. It's hard to say if the time that passes, because from what I understand, there will be some time that will pass between the last film and this film. Something between seven or eight years will have passed. Now, I'm not sure if the reason for this passage of time is going to be related to an injury from, let's say, Bane, or this is just the continuation of the last film where Batman is kind of going into hiding and he's being chased and he just kind of goes away to kind of get away from it all. But... We don't know yet. Are they going to try to do like maybe some flashbacks where you get to see how, you know, he spent this amount of time away, similar to how they did in the first film where he goes out to the Himalayas and, the, you know, to find himself type of deal. Yeah, well, I kind of like that stuff. I like that early training stuff. They actually handled it well. Well, I've seen the prologue and I've seen how they're handling it. And this movie is trying to be a little bit topical with recent American and world history in addition to maybe taking new directions. In the prologue, you get the impression that Bane is being treated like he's under rendition. He's got a hood on him, which is making a little statement, I suppose, against, or at least acknowledging some of the things that have been in the news recently. But he's already about Bane? About how the Iraq war and things. Now, we don't know it's Bane yet. We see characters being brought to a small plane, a CIA-type plane, with hoods over their heads, and then being taken someplace with some dialogue. Now, they're treated on this plane like they're prisoners of some type of war. And their psychological means are being used against them. They're opening the plane door as if they're going to be tossed out. A gun is being fired and being put to people's head as if they're going to be shot or somebody's going to be shot. All while this is happening, other things are happening around this plane where another plane is about to intercept it. Now, eventually when we see the mask come off and it's Bane. It's pretty scary at first because you're like, holy crap, what's this? Now, Bane is portrayed a little different. He has a heavy mask over his face, bald, beefy, which is similar to the cartoon in the comic, but not exactly the same portrayal. But it's scary then because now, even though these people think they're in charge, clearly Bane is in charge of this whole thing. And it's only a matter of time. And then basically, after you see the trailer, after you see the prologue, you'll know what happens. Well, we don't get none of this in the trailer. The trailer seems to evade that entire sequence altogether. The trailer, you get the feeling that part of it has to do with Batman is being asked to return in some shape or form from wherever the hell it is that he's out doing, whether he's recovering or finding himself or whatever. Then you kind of see also something about a bad guy that is obviously Bane being some kind of a rallying force for like what looks like to be prisoners or something. And like he's releasing prisoners out into the streets again, similar to what we've seen before with Dark Knight and even the Scarecrow. I think in Dark Knight, there's part of that whole thing about releasing the either the insane asylum or the prisoners. And all of a sudden, kind of like 
hitting the city again, coming after what we see as a football stadium being like demolished into the ground. You get to see like street fighting in what looks like very metropolitan areas, which we know they shot some of it in New York and Philadelphia, very, you know, iconic kind of locations. So you're trying to kind of blend these things together. And then on top of everything, you get the introduction of Catwoman, which again, we can't tell too much from, That's the, the, weirdest from the trailer. One. Is she in cahoots with Bane or is she a she another her own entity? Yeah. Right. Is she up to something else? Well, that's the problem with a lot of these Batman movies. They seem to feel the need to have too many characters involved. Last one was Joker, but also Harvey Dent. And I think they actually underused Harvey Dent the last time and overused the Joker, but that's, but that's worked, what happened. They kind of worked independent of each yeah. other. They well, weren't. I, this wasn't like the Tim Burton's Batman's where all the bad guys are in cahoots with yeah, each other. Yeah, they all wind after, up on a submarine, right? Stuff like that. But I have a feeling this Catwoman, where the Catwoman was basically a socialite type who was into stealing jewels and things in the comics, in the comics, and yeah. in the cartoons. I feel this one is trying to make a social statement that she is playing the part of a socialite, but in reality is politically part of the recent Occupy type movement where the lower percentage of the people, the poorer people, are finally at odds with the richer people. And in the trailer, they, she makes a comment to Bruce Wayne that when you wake up, it's going to be uh, hard for you to imagine that you lasted this, that you were so unfair, basically. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know which way they're going to go with her. I find it a little hard to believe that they would paint her kind of like a Robin Hood type of character because traditionally, again, I'm not a big comic book person, but even based on the Burton films, she is a bad guy. She didn't used to be a bad guy, but when she's Catwoman, she is a bad guy. So I don't think that the script would go in that direction unless they want to make her ambiguous. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why they needed her, but it's it's getting interesting by seeing that. And I don't particularly like when they try to take off on very recent social commentary because we really don't know where this is all going. And to use that can possibly, you know, backfire on them if by the time the movie comes out, something bad has happened in the real world one way or the other. How do you put that? It's kind of like in V for Vendetta where they were talking about blowing up buildings and stuff like that. And then real buildings were getting blown up. It was a little touchy subject. Well, I'm going to wait and see because so far, Nolan has not disappointed me in terms of how he handles his scripts. And another thing we got to see in this trailer is some hardware that we haven't seen before. At the end of the trailer, you get to see the appearance of what looks like almost like a plane, like a hovering plane type of thing. It's definitely a Batman toy <laughs> but you also see a couple of tumblers that are not necessarily batman's tumblers they look like they're painted to look like military tumblers so there's some of that happening too and you do get a quick shot of joseph gordon levitt who it's still questionable as to who he's playing is he playing a possible future villain or a possible future hero you never know so Again, this is the first trailer, so this is just a snippet of what we're looking at. I'm sure there's at least one more, you know, fuller, richer, you know, more explicit trailer coming, you know, in the next few months. So by the end of the trailer, the only thing we do know is that Bane is going to give Batman one heck of an ass kicking. They even have it on the poster. They show you Bane's back and then they show you the Batman mask cracked as if he just let him have it really good. The next trailer we've seen is the trailer for The Hobbit, which, you know, this is one we've been waiting for for a while now. The movie has been plagued with delays and recasting of directors. As if almost it wasn't going to happen at one point. Oh, it was, it was just back and forth. The previous director had to bail because of conflicts due to the delays. Guillermo del Toro still remains, you know, as one of the credits, I think, as one of the writers, but he was supposed to direct it, and then it went back to Peter Jackson again. We've talked a little bit about this before in a previous episode when we were talking about New York Comic Con, and the preview material that we were shown, which is mainly pictures. They haven't shown us any actual footage. Well, now we finally got an actual trailer and it has so much of the flavor of Lord of the Rings yeah. that we have seen on movies lately. The look is exactly the same. The characters, obviously the returning characters look the Shire perfect. is the same. Yeah, everything has been recreated perfectly. The new characters mostly look like they belong right there. It almost looks like deleted scenes because they fit so 
neatly into what we've already seen before. And there's glimpses of returning characters that we know from the Lord of the Rings. Right. What makes this different is that we're going in prequel world. And this is based on the prequel book, The Hobbit, which is one book. However, for movie purposes, they're breaking it up into two. Which, again, I like. I mentioned that during our Harry Potter and our vampire discussions, that they really need to spread it out. And that gives us more movies to see. Right. Now, the books, I was never a fan of the books. I mean, I remember having to read The Hobbit in maybe high school, and I don't even think I completed it. I think I got kind of bored with it. <laughs> Same thing with me. I, 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 I It was elementary it. school I was given it, and I tried. I just wasn't into that genre, you know? I even tried, I believe, once when video rentals first started back in the probably mid-80s. The Ralph Bakshi? Is that yeah, the, the cartoon yeah. of The Hobbit? And that also bored me to tears, <laughs> but it gave you a little bit of an image of what this world is really like, and it still didn't do anything for me. Once the Lord of the Rings films, the Peter Jackson films came out, that grabbed me right away and sucked me right in. Unfortunately, not to the extent where I want to grab all the books and read them. I might do that one day, <laughs> but the movies at least kept me going really well, and this seems to fit right into there. Yeah, and I think it's better. I think we're the recipient of a gift that there were those delays and the studio problems because this is Peter Jackson's baby. It's like doing a Star Wars movie that George Lucas isn't a participant in. Whether you like him or hate him, it's his thing. And Peter Jackson was the heart behind these movies. So without him, I mean, I think he was going to be involved as a producer all along. So it wasn't like he was not going to be there. But this is something that I think we need. And if you're going to go back to that world, let the guy who made it so popular in recent years be the guy in charge. Well, this particular story seems to center around the character of Bilbo Baggins, which was played by E.M. Holmes in the previous films. Granted, he's not the star of the films, but here he is. It's the central character, which this particular adventure is based on. Now, with that they had to recast a younger actor, obviously, to play him as a younger hobbit. And the actor they pick is Martin Freeman, who some of you might know him from the original BBC The Office. He played the lead salesman character to Ricky Gervais's uh, boss. You also have Kate Blanchett returning, Orlando Bloom. I guess they're going to somehow figure them, you know, work them into either cameos or actual characters that belong in that story. Ian McKellen is in there, and even Christopher Lee apparently is in it. So they got a good bunch of people there in terms of not straying off too much with new people, you get a good combination of everything. Now, on the trailer, we see a lot of talking heads because obviously it's the beginning, like we mentioned before. The They're effects. trying to reintroduce you because right. there's people who are younger now and may not have even seen the Lord of the Rings movies. They're 10 years old now. Right. And like we said before, we are going to get more trailers, more special effects laced trailers. Here, you don't see too much, but you do see locations, you see places, you see groups of people. And that's pretty cool. And the premise of it, an adventure. Right. And it's very talky in terms of you get to see these people interact with each other. This isn't one of these quick cut music video looking things where you really don't know what's happening. You just get flashes of images. You get pretty substantial information as far as how these characters look and talk and that sort of thing, which is important. And you get that feel of this is the beginning of setting up a group that are about to do something, kind of like in the Lord of the Rings film. Where well, I didn't even really have any interest in the Lord of the Rings. You got me to watch The Fellowship of the Ring right before we were all going to see The Two Towers. And I actually enjoyed it. I'm glad I did get to see them. But by the end, by the return of the king, I mean, I just felt like it went on and on and it, and it ended and then it ended again. And then it ended again. <laughs> and I think it's still ending somewhere. Maybe there's a special special edition, I think, has recently come out where there's more happening, you know, more endings. And I just had enough at that point of the whole world, the Oscars. It went everything that year as if, you know, and I think that was in respect to the three movies. The, the last one won so many awards. But I was fine that there was no more. But now that I've seen this one and I'm pleased by what I see with Peter Jackson, I'm actually looking forward to it. Right. And like I said before, they're splitting this one up. This is something they could have done a long time ago. They could have done it with the original Lord of the Ring films. They could have split the books up into And I think in hindsight, books. if they could have split those movies into six movies, they could have. I think they would have wished they did. However, at the time, it was still kind of a, like a gutsy, risky move to shoot all these films back to back without knowing whether they're going to be a success or not. So, yeah. So talking about six movies or four movies or whatever, right. it they would really have been a, a right. I mean, it was, it was three books, so they figure three movies. Now everybody knows it's going to be the wave of the future. Right. I mean, obviously, because The Hobbit is one book, 
and it's a pretty lengthy book as far as the material they need to cover, it's easier for them to just break yeah. it up. And that also gives them the opportunity to introduce, which I understand, new characters that are not even part of the book. Because they have that much space, now they can kind of shoehorn some new material that was never part of the main book. So that's how they're going to kind of work their way into this sort of thing. But like I said before, the trailer looks pretty cool. It seems to be exactly where you left off. Not in terms of the continuity, but the style and the look. You even get to see Gollum at the end. You know, he's out there. You know, that was a surprise. And I don't know. I never read, I never got to the end of The Hobbit. Is the co- character of Gollum in The Hobbit? I believe he's a, he's a pretty noticeable character <laughs> maybe that maybe if i had finished that assignment back in third or fourth or fifth grade <laughs> see this is where it comes to bite you in the ass not doing your homework <laughs> when do i need to know fractions <laughs> there you go now granted this isn't a summer film this is going to be a year from now so think about it this it's is a, a long time this is a ahead. trailer you're going a year from now this is how far in advance these things are and the second part comes a year from then so we're looking at a two-year commitment here Let's jump to our last film right now, which is a film that we talked about a few episodes ago because certain pictures were released to start the promotion machine for Prometheus, which is the next chapter in the Alien franchise. This one, from what we understand, is somewhat of a prequel in terms of when it takes place, but it apparently does not want to be a direct, direct continuation or pre-continuation, if there is such a word, as a standard prequel. They're treating this differently. They want to treat it, from what I understand, as a sci-fi film that has a very, very huge connection to the first Alien film, but it is not the main leading story. You know, that's not what drives the film, from what I understand. Now, on this trailer, first of all, it's a great trailer in terms of, it's a very, I don't want to say music video-ish type of trailer, because it is quick cuts. You see a lot in terms of gigantic sets, full-blown effects. I I felt like, again, I'm watching watching Alien, the underlying bit of music and the feeling of like a scream, a a hollow scream of some type, and the individual lines coming across the screen to eventually fill out the title, where originally the same thing with Alien, and it just had that vibe. And I respect the fact that he's telling people in interviews, this isn't a prequel, this isn't an Alien movie. It's smart of him, because when you say the word, it's an alien movie, it's an alien prequel, if certain members of the audience don't get the monster or the, the same thing, they're going to be annoyed. This has to stand on its own, but this is definitely in that world. Explain the spaceship. Well, that's the thing. The trailer, and again, this is the first trailer. I'm sure we're going to see some more, but you get a number of shots that they're there and you know what you're dealing with. There's a shot of what looks like to be the space jockey being lifted from an underground kind of... Uh, like rising into position. Right, like a, like an underground elevator that brings him into the spot where we see him in Alien, sitting right there in the middle of that cavernous biomechanical location. You see a shot of what looks like to be the derelict ship from the original film where the space jockey in, is in, actually in being orbit, used. and it shows you as if the ship is exploding in some shape or form and part of it is starting to come crashing down. You see a ship that looks, again, like the derelict ship, almost as if it had just fallen into the ground and it's sitting upright, almost like in a shoehorn. Now, the Prometheus type of shape. title is a ship. It's the title of the ship? I'm not entirely sure if it's the ship that we saw in the beginning, that four-engine ship that we saw, yeah. or it's something else. Okay. I'm not entirely sure. Another quick shot that we get is, if you look carefully, there's a shot where you see what looks to me like the space jockey helmet or the space jockey head being moved forward on what it looks like to be a medical examination table. And to me, that's the space jockey, that bony looking skeleton head with the very long snout part. And in the shot, you see it coming forward towards the screen. There have been rumors on the internet, if you start looking for spoilers, that the space jockey character might be an actual walking, talking character, that they're actually developing it as somebody in this movie so could be then we see a shot later on of again the derelict ship it looks as if it's either rolling or beginning to collapse which would make sense because the manner in which it's found in alien the ship has kind of tipped over and it's sitting on its side you see that the weird horn like sections for all we know the ship could also be a derivative of the alien ship. In other words, it's the same style ship, but it might not necessarily be the same one. Texture-wise, it looks very much like the alien derelict ship. 
And I don't know, but I know that they're trying to downplay the prequel aspect of this, but this is definitely that universe. It's right there. The other shots that you see of the trailer, again, this is done very quick cuts, very, you know, you want to call it MTV-ish looking, but it works. The imagery you see could belong to any generic sci-fi film. In other words, there are no real other connections that you would say that's the alien world you're dealing with. Well, but it blends little, very well. There's a little tagline that says, like, their beginning could be our end or something like that. Now, the name Prometheus comes from the Titan who stole fire and gave it to regular people. Now, if that tagline is any indication, whatever this is, is the equivalent of fire, which fire can be good and fire can be bad. But, well, you well know, we talked about this before. Yeah. One of the things that they're trying to promote is that the story itself deals with the birth of mankind. It has something to do with either the progression of the evolution of man. Where we came or where we're going. Where we came from, where we're going. To me, it kind of harkens back to 2001 type of territory. that's what Ridley Scott is kind of like saying. Like, this is not an alien movie. This is more that type of movie. Yeah, it seems like he wants to make it more of a, I don't know if you can call it spiritual. Now, is this one movie? movie. Is this one movie or is this another one that there's a spread out or there might be a second one? As far as I know, this is it. And you got to see also a lot of quick shots of the cast, a lot of cast members. And again, it's like, it's a huge tease because you want to see more and you want to see longer of what you saw. Because as opposed to... And you don't want to wait to June. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. But as opposed to The Hobbit, where you got to see prolonged kind of scenes where people talk to each other and answer each other's questions, you know, not quick cut. This is cut, cut, yeah. cut, cut, cut. The and mus- looks dire. Oh yeah, the music, it looks like it's completely action-packed. But what I do creepy. notice... What I do notice is, and I don't know, you know, obviously there's vehicles or vehicles. The vehicles we saw in Aliens, it's almost like their predecessors make an appearance here because they have some militaristic type of transports in this trailer. Well, here's the thing. With Aliens, we got to see their technology, which wasn't, especially the ground transportation, wasn't that futuristic. But if you think about it, nowadays, there are vehicles in the army, for example, that kind of like, yeah, transport, yeah. Ve- military transports, they're very boxy, very, you know, The shielded. Bradley fighting vehicle yeah, is a smaller version of, stuff. of the, so uh, of, of the you uh, aliens. Fig- you figured, yes, this takes place hundreds of years before aliens, because aliens was already 57 years after alien. But it's several years past where we are now. Well, of course. So I think you're at a point now where it's hard to pinpoint the technology, especially in this particular area alien genre there's too much there for you to say oh that's too old or that's too new what i was surprised the most is again is the amount of special effects shots that we got to see because again normally you don't see that but granted this film's coming out in the summer so this isn't the hobbit the hobbit still has a whole year to play with special effects these guys right now should be finishing up their special effects and probably scoring similar to what batman is probably doing right now finishing everything up well i'm impressed usually i'm not that excited about these types of things usually would take like a harry potter or something but These three, two of which I didn't think I'd have any interest in, now I'm really looking forward to all three of them. Definitely. I can't wait, not only for the films to come out, but at this point, I can't wait to see more trailers. And guaranteed, there's got to be at least one more of each. Sometimes you get two more. So there's plenty of information and material that's going to slowly trickle our way. And, you know, this is usually when they do it. Usually the end of the year, the beginning of the year is when they give you something to chew on to keep you going, you know, until the next round comes out. But I would like to thank James for joining me today at this trailer preview that we had. And we will see you here next time when we review some more films, toys, commentaries, all that kinds of weird stuff. Until then, I'm Carlos Perone. See you next time on Geek Fest Rants. Bye-bye. My dear Frodo. You asked me once if I had told you everything there was to know about my adventures. While I can honestly say I have told you the truth, I may not have told you all of it. Bilbo Baggins. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure. I can't just go running off into the blue. I am a Baggins. Wait! Of Bag End. Bilbo. Allow me to introduce Feely, Keely, Oin, Loin. Darling, Balin. Biffer, Hofer, Bumper. Dory, Dory, Dory. And the leader of our company, Sorin Oakenshield. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old. 
to tell when you come back. Can you promise that I will come back? No. And if you do, you will not be the same. My name is Bilbo Baggins. Baggins. What is that? Baggins. Precious. Stop.